Welcome to Eye on the Illini. This is Mike Kegley. I am here with Mike Gross of the LMP Media Group. He has been covering the Penn State Nittany Lions and Illinois fans, of course, are super excited as number 19 Illinois will visit number nine Penn State at 6.30 p.m. Central Time on Saturday night on NBC. And the only counter programming out there <laughs> I, know where, I know where you're going with this. Is is Georgia visiting Alabama? Yeah, if you're interested in that sort of thing. Yeah, I tell you what, you talk about, is there any way they could have a tougher uh, game to go up against? Yeah, yeah, if you care about ratings. <laughs> yeah, I was just ideal. like. It's not ideal. But I will tell you, though, this game is a good one, and big the Big Ten fans do like to flex their muscles in terms of attraction. So maybe Illinois and – Penn State will do a nice number. Illinois is a good ratings team when they're good. It's oh, okay. just that they're not often good in football. <laughs> so yeah, I, yeah, and you're. I think the Big Ten generally does pretty well, and of course, uh, ratings wise, and of course, they have this monolithic phalanx of re- partnerships with uh, networks. And uh, uh, this is, I think, Penn State's first NBC game under that arrangement. Anyway, yeah. But that, and that will be cool. Like I said, are they doing a whiteout or anything like that? Uh, well, James season? Franklin uh, is calling for an unofficial whiteout, or at least, as he put it, whiteout energy. Okay. He's kind of made a big thing of that. And actually, the original whiteouts were just sort of the students informally coming up with the idea, like, hey, everybody wear white, and uh, so there's no reason why they can't. It's going to be loud, though. It's going to be loud. Hey, they put they – put, it, the crowd was announced at 109,000 plus for Kent State. Now it wasn't really that, but it was. I was surprised how big it was. It's going to be. It'll be around that number. That number, 109,000, will probably be for real on Saturday night. I I do think when they do the whiteout, that may be the most intimidating look for a stadium yeah. in the country. Because it cool. is unbelievable how that works, especially cool. for it a looks night great game. on television, and it's really, it really is loud to the point where there's been times when it's impacted the game because teams have just not been able to communicate, and then they've had to call timeouts or pre-snap penalties, that kind of thing. Uh, and sometimes the old uh, press box literally shakes with uh, with noise up there. Wow, that is, that is just incredible. Let's talk a little bit about this game. Illinois comes in with its third four-game winning streak to start a season since 1951. They did that in 1951. They did it in 2011 in Ron Zook's ill-fated 6-0 start that finished 0-6, costing him his job. (laughs) And then this year under Brett Bielma, 2024. It's easy to keep track of Illini high success seasons in terms of football, and that's what Brett Bielma was hired to change. So Drew Aller comes into town. I think he's a guy who's got the million dollar physique. He looks like a quarterback. And with Andy Kotelnicki there, it scares me that last year he looked like a quarterback physically. This year he plays like a quarterback. Is this development? Am I seeing what's really happening or am I just making this up in my mind? I, I, I think you're seeing it. I think I think you're seeing it. Yeah, I, uh, it, it's his third year in the program. You would think so. Uh, his uh, arm talent, as the NFL people say, is elite. I mean, he can absolutely fire a football. Uh, and I was just talking with some other guys about this earlier on a, on a podcast. Uh, all of the throws that he was physically capable of making a year ago, he now can see. He now sees them and therefore makes them. Uh, I think there's a difference in his demeanor. There's a difference in his decision-making ability. Also, he's a leaner, more athletic guy just physically, and he's a pretty effective runner. And certainly, uh, you know, a couple first downs a game and extending the play here and there is what you really want. So that's one of the big stories of them so far, obviously factoring in small sample size and strength of schedule it appears that he has taken a significant uh, next step. 
Well, that's exactly what we didn't want to hear as Illini fans. How has Andy Kotonicki's effect been on the team? Because for Illini fans who may not be familiar, he was the offensive coordinator for Lance Leipold and Kansas, and he yeah. has worked with Lance for years. And Kansas really looks like Superman without a cape this year. And I'm wondering if a lot of that might be the fact that Andy is no longer there to call the plays. Has he made a difference in what Penn State is doing? There's there, there's no question about it. And and uh as as you know, if you're familiar with Kansas, a lot of what the a lot of what his magic dust is, it comes before the snap. It's it's moving people around and doing some very he's do he does some things that I've really never seen before. We've had offensive linemen split out like slot receivers and then in motion and coming in the block against Kent State, they had the centers over the ball ready to snap it. The other four offensive linemen are out bunched together like four wide receivers. And <laughs> that one I've never seen before. And Kent State just called timeout. They just, their kid, they were looking around and talking to each other and try, and the coach just said, let's just, <laughs> let's put a stop to this. And the other thing they've done is, uh, the other thing he's done is made a lot of uh, he's made a lot of interesting use of it. They have a terrific tight end, Tyler Warren, yep. and they made really good use of him. He he threw a touchdown pass from a direct snap uh, on Saturday, and also uh, ran you know ran from a direct snap. Uh, they do a lot of different stuff. I don't think they run a ton of plays. I just think they do a lot of things to confuse you uh, about what's coming. Yeah, and for those people who are interested, I did a podcast, the Heat Checks and Hail Marys, on September 2nd, where I actually noted that Penn State's Koto Nicky might be the next big coaching hire. I think if he can wow. make Drew Aller do and improve, help be part of his improvement, right? He, he very well may position himself after seeing Kansas fall off as a guy who people want on their sidelines. Now, let's talk a little bit about Penn State, they've got a, a, a rushing attack. But before we talk about the running backs, how is that offensive line playing right now for the Nittany I, Lions? Yeah, I think it's playing pretty well. I I, I don't think it's it's been a problem. It's, the offensive line, to to a large extent, is you only notice it when they screw up. But they've run the ball pretty consistently well. Uh, now they have not faced a great run defense, not even close. I mean, even West Virginia is a pretty good team. Uh, uh, did not have a great run defense uh, and they, they lost both tackles and the starting center to the NFL. And one of the tackles, Olu Fushanu, yes. was I think the number 10 pick in the draft to the jets. Uh, so they have some significant uh, holes to fill, but they they have some depth up front. They play kind of played a lot of people so far uh, and they're a little young, but I think they're I think they're really solid. This the new center, Nick Dawkins, who is Daryl Dawkins' son, by the way. For oh NBA. my goodness, there yeah. there is a chocolate thunder from uh, from Love Tron. He's not as big <laughs> as his dad. Uh, I, I think he's more articulate than his dad. He's really a bright kid. But anyway, he's a good fit at center. And then they have a couple of kids that were really highly recruited at the tackle spot, and they have a true freshman guard named Cooper Cousins who's a very highly recruited kid, a five-star kid who is playing a lot inside. Uh, so I, I think they've been – I think they have at least met expectations yeah. in that unit I'm talking about. Yeah, and, and when it comes to the running game, they've been blessed with some pretty good running backs. How, how is that run, working out this year? Because right now this is shaping up as being a podcast that's not going to be super enjoyable for Illini fans. <laughs> well, you know how it goes. Yep. I've, you know, I've seen a couple of Illinois games so far, at least parts of them, and I'm impressed with their team. Uh, Bielema has done a great job. I think I, I like their offense. I think their coordinator has done a really nice job. But anyway, you're asking me about running backs. Uh, uh, you know, the big thing, Nick Singleton – is a super athletic, super strong, super fast guy who needs to learn how to uh, put the brakes on once in a while, stop and go, make people miss, spin move. He, that, that's what's missing. And we've seen some of that this, this year so far. And also, he's a pretty good blocker and a pretty good receiver. And I think the, the running backs as receivers, that's going to be a 
over time will be a Kodal Nicky thing. I think uh, that's something that uh, they will feature somewhat. And then the other running back who's kind of their 1A and 1B with yep. Singleton is Katron Allen, who a uh, guy from IMG down in Florida. He was also not quite the recruit that Singleton was because Singleton was uh, – National High School Player of the Year, right, right. But but Allen is Allen is that guy who turns a three yard run into a six yard run. He does. He is good at making people miss, and he's a tough guy, uh, and also very athletic. So I mean, they're they're blessed, I guess you'd say, in that position, in that position group. This is the run my own business dream. This is the college's paid for dream. This is the retire early dream. This is Busey, where your dreams and possibilities become moments through trusted guidance and expertise, through lifelong relationships. Because we're here to help you achieve the life you've always envisioned. Yeah, and when it comes to speed on the outside, what are, what is Illinois going to run into with this wide receiver core, which it seems to me Penn State has been cursed a little bit when they have great wide receivers, they don't have great quarterback play. And then when they have great quarterback play, they haven't had wide receivers. Are we seeing a season where the, the two may meet? Well, I think their their wide receiver group is better than it was last year. That was a real problem for them last year. They would, they have a couple of their key games were, I mean, they'd be in the third quarter and a wide receiver hadn't even been targeted yet. I mean, it was weird the way the way it was. Uh, they have a they have a kid named Harrison Wallace, Trey Wallace, Harrison Wallace, the third who had a huge game against West Virginia. And he's a guy who's never really been healthy in his career before this year. And Franklin's been touting him. Well, he he's been pretty good. And then another one named Omari Evans, who was big on Saturday against Kent State, more of a deep threat kind of guy. And then they have. Uh, Julian Fleming, a transfer from Ohio State, who was one of the most highly recruited kids in the country uh, from Pennsylvania. That was a big miss for Franklin uh, in recruiting, but he's he's back. And uh, I mean, they have a lot of guys. I'm not going to tell you that that wide receiver is one of their strongest position groups, but I would say compared to last year, it might be one of their more improved position groups. Yeah, last year they, from watching three or four games, it just didn't seem like the wide receivers could get the separation, which forced a young quarterback to have to really thread the needle more often than what you'd like to ask a, yeah, a, a and he was, yeah, and some of that was uh, Aller being maybe overly cautious as a first year starter, but no, you, no doubt you're right. Some of that was the wide receivers just not being <laughs> that great at. At, uh, at getting open. I think some of it was Mike Yersich, the, the then offensive coordinator. So uh, maybe Kodal Nicky's, uh, you know, solving that uh, a little bit. But they're going to be facing, I think, one of the best pass defenses in America. Uh, yeah, and, Illinois' know, defensive backfield is – yeah. last year you could see – and in the Illini guys, you know, we got called homers a little bit for being – nice about the Illinois secondary, but you could well, tell. Well, a non-homer just said it here. You know. Yeah, well, I appreciate that because you could you could tell last year when they were getting lit up that, that the physical talent was there. They were just young and inexperienced. And you can't know something before you learn something. Yeah. And unfortunately, Big Ten coordinators are ruthless men, and they expose those players on what they hadn't learned yet. And I think they're using that very effectively this year. And I will say Aaron Henry does one thing that that really reminds me of what Kotelnicki does, is he disguises coverages, whether they're coming up for the run, whether they're going to drop into pass coverage extremely well. And that was really why they beat Jalen Daniels, because Daniels had several times where he switched into a a pass play and it it wasn't a good match and they actually suckered him into it. Mm -hmm. And Illinois is doing a little bit of what you see in the NFL. They're very good at disguising what they're in so that as you walk up to the line, a quarterback can't go, well, let's see, my I'm going to go to this guy first, that guy next, and have his progression in his mind. Which means, yeah, I know which you means mean. your quarterback is forced to read and react live, and that's a lot different than when Peyton Manning would know every single guy he was going to throw to and in order. So yeah, I think that's that. If there if there's a sort of an X and O 
ski or um, key to this matchup. I sort of think it's that. It's maybe Aller and Kotelnicki against that excellent uh, Illinois secondary and and their and their coaches. And- Aaron Henry is a very good coordinator. He unfortunately had to leave after the game at Nebraska and fly home. His uh, sister passed away and then basically had a visitation on Saturday, funeral on Sunday, and then back to Champaign Sunday night. So he's coming back on that. But I will tell you that that the whole Illini defense is probably very focused because Codell Nicky and Kansas won in boxing terms. It was a unanimous decision. They put it to, uh, they put it to them a little bit. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. so they've got to be thinking like, okay, we've got to be really focused for this Penn State team. So let's flip over to the other side of the ball. You've given us a great understanding of what they're going to be doing on offense. Defensively, Illinois, of course, is known with Brett Bielma as a team that likes to run. They've got a really good tailback room. Maybe don't have the high end that that Penn State might have, but yeah, but, but, yeah, but, but the other guys are really good. They can do what they need to do. Yeah. What type of defensive line play in terms of run defense? How good are they, and and what can Illinois expect from Penn State's D line? I, th- I think that the, I think that the D line is one of the areas that that is kind of going to be uh, on the other side of the ball a key to this matchup because I don't think that Penn State has faced a really tough physical. Uh, running game to the extent that they're probably going to on Saturday night. Uh, uh, they have they have two very good edge rushing ends, Abdul Carter and Denied Dennis Sutton, both elite recruits, mega athletic guys. They're going to be pros. Uh, but are they at the point of attack run stuffers? They haven't done a whole lot of that. Uh, Carter was an all all Big Ten linebacker last year who moved to DN. Uh, they have they have good depth. At tackle, Zane Durant is a guy, uh, a name that maybe you could remember who's a, a, a tough guy. But they're not, you know, they don't have the, the gigantic, three, like a 350-pound middle clogger type guy. Right. They don't they don't have that. They have a lot of good athletes up front and a lot of depth that I mentioned about Carter. And, and, uh, and but here's another thing about this in, in the running game. I think, you know, Tom Allen is the new coordinator, the former Indiana yes. coach, and, and he likes to do – he likes to play three safeties at the same time. And one of those safeties he considers like a hybrid. Yep. Uh, and they have a guy named Jalen Reed who has been very effective in that role. He's He was terrific against West Virginia. He had a great game in that game. And I thought their defense was great that game. But anyway, um, it'll be interesting to see if they try to do that, that look, that three safety look with Reed, or go to three linebackers and play a more conventional 4-3 uh, when they're trying to face a team like a uh, Bielema coach team and, and Illinois, what we, what we've seen of them. And a, a key thing here is uh, a guy named Kevin Winston, who is a safety for Penn state, who is a terrific player. He might be Penn state's best defensive player. He's hurt and it's a long-term thing. He's out. So will they be, so they're playing a true freshman. I okay. think they're going to be mostly playing a true freshman, a kid named Dewan Lane. Uh, in his absence, and he played a lot against Kent State and played pretty well. But will they be able to do that three safety thing? Will they have to tr- play a three, a third linebacker in the game? I think that's something you can watch even pre-snap. That's going to be a key to that because they are going to have to stop the run. That's for sure. Yeah, I think, and I do think that Luke Altmeyer has played this year with a precision, uh, particularly. I like him. Yeah, he yeah. and I tell you, he he puts it. We we've joked about it. There's a couple times, particularly on the deep balls, that his placement is so good that you laugh and you say Tom Brady couldn't have dropped that ball in a better yeah. position. Now that's a that's obviously a little bit of an unrealistic hyperbole, but he has really developed quite a relationship with each of his wide receivers, whether it's Pat Bryant or Zachary Franklin, and that is something that. Illinois fans are adapting to. Now, when I grew up, we were used to the Mike White offense where you had Dave Wilson, you had Tony Eason, you had Jack Trudeau, and then oh, yeah. uh, you had Jeff George play for Makovic. And and so you had great wide receivers like David Williams and, and others. It's a neat thing to be back to those days. We really haven't had a great wide receiver since Regis Ben. And now all of a sudden on both sides, you feel like 
two guys who will probably play on Sunday. And they both are very sure-handed. You know, I remember I remember from last year's game, there was a couple of times, if I'm remembering this right, there was one for sure that I can remember very clearly, where, where Allmeyer threw, they, they really like all out through the deep ball, just chuck it down the yep. field and try to make a big play. And one one time in particular, Daquan Car- Hardy, who was then a corner for Penn State, the, it was a pretty great throw, and Daquan Hardy made as good of – he ended up intercepting it. He made as yep. good a play as a, I've ever seen a quarterback make. It was just perfect execution. So it wasn't like that was a bad ball at all. I thought there was a couple like that, maybe not interceptions, but breakups. Right. Uh, so I, I Yeah, I like Elmire. I think he's – and, again, it's another thing. It, it's another year of development, another year of figuring it out, similar to Drew Aller. Yeah, and I, I do like the idea of having your offensive coordinator, your head coach, your quarterback, and your defensive coordinator all coming back, which has not been because of the success Illinois has not had. That's not something that you could always count on. Yeah, I, I feel like their coaching situation is pretty good right now. Uh, you know, and and then can can you recruit enough to get with the big boys? That's the long term project. I, but but their team right now is uh, looks pretty good to me. How how is Brett Bielema perceived throughout the league? Because we've we of course have people who remember the very young Brett Bielema, <laughs> who was at Wisconsin, and um, sometimes you know with youth comes comes maybe some bravado that you don't maybe have when you're a little older in life. And of course, a lot of people look at Arkansas as a, as a time when he went there and found out that maybe some of his theories didn't work in the SEC or certain, or at least certainly with Arkansas in the SEC. Yeah, that's I think you said it there. And then he had the opportunity to pick up some stuff off of Bill Belichick, and now he's back at Illinois. How has he looked at? Well, I don't I don't hear people talking about Brett Bielema very right. often, to be honest with you. However, I do feel like the I. My sense would be that the perception is what he's done at, at Illinois, what he's done lately uh, has probably risen his stock a little bit. I think people uh, I think people see this for what it is, which is a pretty good, solid job. Uh, it, it sort of feels to me like their offense is a mixture of the coordinator and Bielema a little bit. I don't yes. know if that's right, but that's just how that's my sense of it. And uh, and and. I don't know. Bielma seems uh, he seems so, his his manner is now that he's been around a while. He seems like a, like a wise sort of crafty guy where maybe he did seem like a little bit more, uh, you know, arrogant or whatever when he was a younger guy. Maybe that's just what happens to us as we yeah. <laughs> as we get a little older and get a little, uh, you know, ro- uh, mileage behind us and take some lumps and all that. Uh, I, I, I didn't understand why he wanted to go to Arkansas, to be honest with you. I didn't understand that move. Uh, I mean, there's places in the SEC where you're really, it's really a tough job. I, I thought when Joe Moore had the court, the terrific offensive coordinator of Penn state, when he left to go to Mississippi state and they were in divisions then, yeah. and you're in the same division with Alabama and LSU and, and Auburn. And I mean, uh, I, I, th- I thought he was, I, I think Moorhead is a terrific guy. And I, I, I thought that was a bad move, but it, yeah, I, I think yeah. the stock is uh, steadily rising. I think the Arkansas job is just about to be one of the better jobs because they've got enough NIL dollars with oh, very large right. corporations right, right. that are really gearing up and they've started to dump I money. I forgot about that. Yeah, I had, yeah I they had, started to dump money into Calipari. And now I think whoever's going to follow their current coach is probably going to be a bigger name and is probably yeah. going to get funding that Arkansas football coach has never seen before. Yeah, that makes sense. So, and and you know, J- Jerry Jones is even saying, I'm going to help him win. And it's like, Uh-oh. well, Jer- Jerry, you might want to. Focus on the Cowboys. Yeah, but that, yeah who am yeah, I to throw rocks? Project, you got a job, dude. That was the linebacking then at Penn State. Oh, uh, they have two guys that are on the field almost all the time. One of them is Kobe King. Uh, he's a kid from Detroit. His brother was the good corner last yep, year. He's exactly. in the NFL now, uh, and he he really made a big step last year. He's a very he's the middle linebacker, the guy who calls it, the guy who has the signals in his helmet. And uh, he's just, he's a solid guy. Now he did get banged up a little bit, I think on Saturday. So we'll see how that goes. And then they have a young guy, a kid named Tony Rojas, 
was a very good high school player, uh, that classic like running back slash linebacker guy in high school out of Virginia. And I think he's going to be a star. He's a little bit, little bit undersized. He came in at like 195. Now he's 230 plus and just as athletic. And um, he's he's very good. So most of the time they have those two guys. And then they have another, another a couple of veteran guys, a kid named Tyler Eldson, uh, a, a Dom DeLuca guy who's, who's an overachiever guy. He's around the ball. He's a tough dude, former walk-on. Uh, so when they have three linebackers in the field, those are the, the you know, three of those four, and uh, they've been real good. Rojas is going to be a star. That's just a matter of time. And King is, uh, he's solid as a rock. So they're pretty good in that. I wouldn't yeah. say they're exceptional by the Big Ten standards. It's super, like, elite, but they're real solid. And then when you look at the cornerback position, you gave us a little bit of a preview, but how are they going to match up against Illinois, who right now seems to be a little bit leaning towards the old Brett Bielema model of the bigger wide receivers? They, yeah, you know, oh, okay, they're usually yeah. pretty big and pretty strong. Yeah, they have uh, they have actually have two transfers. They lost three corners who got drafted last year. So uh they 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 made some hay in the portal. They got a guy named AJ Harris, who was a five-star recruit who was at Georgia last year and played some. I'm not yeah. sure why he bailed on that situation, but uh and and he looks very good. And then they have a kid named Jalen Kimber, who also originally was at Georgia and came, transferred from Florida. And he did start at Florida. So he's an experienced guy. And then they have a couple young guys, a kid named Cam Miller, who's been very good. They actually have a freshman, a kid named Elliot Richardson, who's played, who played a lot. And I think started on Saturday. Uh, I guess I think Harris was a little bit ill, like some okay. stomach flu or something like that. So that's why he started. So, um, you know, they like to play man coverage. They like to play tight man coverage. And, you know, when you can do that, that frees you up to do a lot of other things. You can blitz. You can put people in the box and stop the run. It, that's kind of like a luxury. I, I'm not, I, I don't think we've seen enough to say, well, they could just leave those two guys out in an Island and do that right. the way they would ideally like to do. But I think they're talented enough that that will be a possibility. Let's wait and see a little bit. Yeah. And that sounds very much like the Illini defense where they would prefer if they could to do that now, well, they don't always do that, but they do, pref you know, prefer. Yeah. That yeah. I, in fact, Franklin mentioned that today in his press conference, he said, these, these, they're good enough to play press man to man. And uh, yeah, that's a strong, uh, that's a strong part of Illinois. I think is that. Past yep. Now we, when we look at the special teams component, that was one that last week on our eye on the Illini preview show, the Nebraska the insider told us that, the kicking game could be problematic. And I don't know that anybody has been more correct than Caleb Henry was because that game really came down to a, a missed field goal. And he had said that might be a potential issue and he gave Illinois the advantage. So how do the special teams look from a standpoint of the kicking game for Penn State? I think pretty solid. I, I, the, the, the punter, a uh, kid named Riley Thompson, he does kind of that Australian style yep. a little bit. He's been very good. He had a really good game. Um, when was that? Oh, I, I guess the Bowling Green game when they struggled in a lot of other areas. He had a very good game and, and made a little bit of a difference. The kicker, and he's been around a while, he's a kid named Sanders. I want to make sure I'm pronouncing this right. Sanders Syadak. Uh, he missed his first, he missed one at West Virginia and the, overall their kicking game looked like it was not ready for prime time in that game, but, but it, overall it has since gotten much better. He hasn't, it hasn't been much of a factor. Uh, they have a punt return guy, Caden Saunders, who is a wide receiver has not played at all at wide receiver, but they bring him in the game just because they like him catching punts. He's really not much of a factor, I don't think, in the return game. They just are trying to avoid mistakes with the punt return spot. It's kind of weird that he hasn't played on offense at all, but they keep trotting him out there as a punt returner. They have a lot of athletes on special teams. They have a lot of guys that can run. They have so many defensive backs who can run, and that's how they get their feet wet and figure it out. I wouldn't say that's a huge strength for Penn State, but I don't think it's a weakness. Right. And in terms of kicking off, they have a guy who gets the ball deep then or. Yeah. Well, he, again, he did not, he did not have a good game in that regard. Okay. At, uh, 
at West Virginia. Since then, he's been good, and I thought he was real good on uh, on Saturday. I'm drawing a blank on his name. He's he weighs like 280. He's the biggest kid yeah. you've ever seen. But but uh, yeah, again, they, and they and that's another thing about Penn State is they almost always have one guy who does kickoffs. One guy who does field goals and extra points. I guess a lot of teams do that. I guess that's right. pretty common. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, th- I think their kicking game is, I would say it's at least at minimum, okay. Red Grange wasn't just a football player. He was a legend. Discover the untold story of Illini great Red Grange in a new novel by Doug Vilhard called The Golden Age of Red. This captivating book takes you back to the 1920s when a humble young Illinois player transformed into the galloping ghost and electrified the nation. Get your copy of The Golden Age of Red by Doug Vilhart today, available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. Perfect. Looking at the schedule, I think Penn State benefited from a schedule. I don't think there's any easy schedules in the Big Ten. Yeah. But they have to feel pretty good as to not have to play Michigan this year and not having to play Oregon. They've basically got Illinois that nobody expected to be ranked, mm-hmm. U- USC, obviously, Ohio State. And I think they've even avoided the Indiana Rutgers duo that I'm not certain how good they are or if their schedule is going to make them better. But is there a lot of pressure on Coach Franklin? Yes. To to go ahead and and find a way to, if nothing else, may you know maybe make it to the Big Ten title game, but at least beat Michigan. Well, they don't. Again, they don't play Michigan. They play. I'm Ohio talking about State. in the run. Finish ahead of Michigan. Oh, finish ahead of Michigan. I see. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, uh, there is. There's no doubt about it. I I think, uh, and I even think if they make the playoff and lose in the first round. A lot of the naysayers about Franklin are going to say, well, big deal. You made the playoffs because they expanded. They tripled the size of the field. Big deal. Uh, so he he almost has to win a playoff game, I think, for to get the dogs off him a, a, a little bit. Uh, it's never going to go away. Uh, he, he makes an awful lot of money. Uh, he somehow is successful enough that every time there's a coaching opening, his name comes up. Right. They're already talking about him for Florida and Florida State. And Florida State, I mean, it, that guy was national coach of the year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, uh, I mean, that that's he, he's in an interesting spot in that way. Uh, and, and some of it is just fans being fans. Uh, some of it is the perception that he's kind of a CEO and not a real elite X and O guy uh, and maybe doesn't even want to be that. Uh, but yeah, yeah, there, there is some pressure. There is some pressure on him. Uh, I, I agree with you. I, I think their schedule, not only the who's on it, cause it's not easy, but right. sort of the sequence of games uh, I, I think is pretty, pretty favorable, uh, pretty favorable to them, and and uh, they have a shot this year. There's no doubt they if they get to the ten wins, I think they probably get in the playoffs, and, and and they might even be able to do more than that. Uh, and and you know the way that the way that for the way the playoff format works with uh, those top four seeds have to be a conference champion. Right. Uh, you you might you might run into. I mean, you know, maybe Georgia and Texas are the best two teams in the country, and one of them is going to be on that yeah. five to eight line in the in the playoffs. I mean, there's a lot of ways that the bracket could fall. There's a lot of things that could go there. Uh, so it's probably not reasonable to say, hey, he has to win a playoff game no matter what. But I think that's how people are going to see it. Yeah, to make it to a CFP game would probably get you a statue at Illinois. And, and <laughs> alongside you know that, that red grain statue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, a long time red, right next to red. Yeah. Um, and so that that is a little bit different. Was there a relationship between Franklin and Kodo Nicky, or, or did he just kind of, you know, have been keeping an eye on him? How did that he, happen? He definitely had been keeping an eye on him for a while. Now, relationship, I think only in the sense of they would run into each other at clinics and, and the annual coaches meetings and stuff like that. But they definitely they definitely were familiar uh, with each other. I think that's one thing that Franklin really 
I mean, you know, the, the most important thing these guys do is recruit. The second most important thing they do is hire assistants. Right. And, and, and uh, so he is very conscientious about keeping abreast of everybody around the country. And, and so he was very, they were very aware of each other uh, before this. And, and obviously what Lance Leopold has done over there, right. you know, and paying attention to that too. So if, if Penn state was to script the perfect game, what would that look like if, if Franklin's in here drawing his X's and O's and, and, and planning out what he wants to have happen? How do, how do you think that game goes? Well, I think one thing that would that is going to have to be an element of it of an ideal situation is going to be pass rush on Altmaier early. I, I think uh, I, I think uh, sort of uh, the energy of the game, taking the fight to that to Illinois early and getting that crowd, getting that whole thing rolling. I think that's an important piece of it. Uh, and, and, and other than that, you know, it's run the ball and stop the run because you know how that goes. If you're ahead of the sticks, then you can do – and Andy Kotelnicki can really open up the playbook and do his thing. I, I think that's that's a big, big part of it. But I, I sort of feel like Penn State has played well up front without getting a lot – without getting a ton of so sacks. They only have four sacks so far. They only had two against Kent State. Uh, but they have the people who can be that – be, they who can blow up plays and and that's I think that's going to be something to watch real early uh, on Saturday night. And then if do you have a feel in your mind how you might see this game finishing up? Do you think this is a a, a Penn State victory? Do you do you think there's an upset in the making? In, any inkling there? I I got to tell you uh, I'm not a gambling person but I pay attention to the lines because I think it's information. My history of doing this for decades and decades tells me that it's information. And I was blown away by the point spread on this game, 17 and a half. I thought it was going to be half of that. Right. I thought it would be around eight and a half, more than a score, but not much more. Uh, I was, I was astounded by that. And, and that tells me that, uh, People are looking at the people in Las Vegas are looking at maybe Illinois coming on the road for a second straight week in a tough spot. Uh, and uh, maybe there's something that they see that I don't. So I, I, I feel more comfortable saying I think Penn State wins it uh, than I was. <laughs> I mean, you shouldn't do it. I guess you shouldn't admit to basing everything on, on a point spread, but that's that really struck me. It, it makes you wonder what they know that we don't know. I do think there is a gap when you look at Illinois recruiting. Yes. Um, there is a gap. Yeah, Penn State is the more talented team, yes. uh, significantly so. Not, I don't think hugely so. And and there's ways that that can be – there's ways that that has diminishing returns. There's ways that you can work around that, nullify that a little bit. And, and Illinois, I think, has done so to, to be where they are. Uh, but Penn State, definitely the more talented. If Illinois were to win the game, what do you think in your mind when you look at the the two teams, what do you think is most likely what went wrong if Illinois gets the win? Uh, well, I would guess uh, that 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 Illinois pass defense would have played a big role. A couple of picks, maybe a, a couple of game changing plays and then maybe Aller gets a little gun shy maybe the confidence wanes a little bit and, and maybe Illinois is just really exceptional at that piece of the game that, that's one way that i can see it turn uh you know and, and the other thing the other thing when i think of Penn State Illinois i i can't stop i can't not think about that nine overtime game a couple of years ago because Oh my God, that was one of the worst. That was one of the worst games I've ever seen in any sport. And it it was the traffic up there that day was a nightmare. It was oh, that was one of the worst days of my working career. <laughs> <laughs> that was so bad, and not because Penn State lost. I don't I don't care about that. But but uh, oh man, that was a brutal. That was a nightmare. That sends uh, shivers down my spine. But but uh, you know, part of that was. Bielema knowing what he had and finding a way, finding a way to kind of ugly up the game and win it because Penn State, at that time, the, the problem was Penn State could not run the ball. I mean, right. absolutely couldn't run the ball at all. 
Yeah, and I that game was painful to watch, even as an Oof. Illini fan. Brutal. But it was made a little better by the fact that the Illini did win. And it's a great I win like, for them. Yeah. Yeah. And I like to tell people, hey, nine overtimes. And I, I try to avoid the actual final score because yeah. then that nine overtime takes the luster right off of it. Was there any question or any subject that you thought we would talk about? Or did I hit all the topics you thought we'd hit? No, I can't. I can't think of anything. We did the we did the white we did the whiteout energy stuff, and we really broke down both sides of the ball. I mean, I uh, obviously you and and your audience know more about Illinois than I do, uh, but I mean, I think it's a I think it's a real game. I think it's an intriguing matchup, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Certainly, it's it feels like it's time to get kind of serious after the last couple of weeks for Penn State. Uh, so yeah, I'm of two minds on Michigan because I thought USC had improved and I think they, they did. And yet Michigan was able to beat them with what? 30 yards of passing and probably being able to throw it at all. Yeah. And I was, I, I, I had to reframe my whole, where is Michigan going to finish? That happens a lot in September, it, it, just in football. Always, yeah. I mean, you, you, uh, I, I was, I thought that Michigan, I thought that USC LSU game was a very high level game. Exactly, I think that was a terrific football game, and and I thought USC is good enough defensively now that look out. Uh, so, and I was not impressed. I thought Michigan was going to take a hit this year, and certainly it looked that way against Texas. All of Texas is. You know, yeah. really exceptional. But, uh, uh, yeah, that was a great win for Michigan. And, you know, sometimes teams just get better. Uh, but I got to believe that people, coaches in the Big Ten, are going to look at that result and say, we can run the ball against USC. Yeah, I got to wonder, with UCLA and, and USC on the horizon for Penn State, uh, Illinois is hoping that they are more focused on the two new guys and <laughs> Illinois is just old hat and they're looking beyond. So. Well, I kind of, I kind of think that uh, Illinois has got their attention with what they've done so far. Yeah. Should be a fantastic game. Yeah, I'm looking forward well, to it. Thanks so much for coming on. I, I really appreciate it. And of course, um, Mike Gross with the uh, LNP media group, which is. His That's in state. Lancaster, Pennsylvania, by the way. Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Yes, yeah. folks. And, and got somebody who's covered this for quite a few years and gives us a good insight into what this Penn State team can do. Thank you so much, and we greatly appreciate you coming on the show. You're welcome. Always a pleasure, Mike. Have a great day. You too. And if you enjoyed that, we also have the Illini Guys Sports Spectacular, our weekly two-hour radio show. It's Illini-centric. You can get that by searching for Alina Guys Sports Spectacular on podcasts. It's on any distributor you want. You can also find our Big Sports Radio, which is our Big Ten-centric radio show that is also played on stations across the country. And you can go search Big Sports Radio and get that at your podcast distributor as well. And subscribing to both of them means you won't miss an episode. And finally, of course, we have the IlliniGuys.com. You can go there and you can subscribe, be a member of Illini Guys. You get all of our articles ahead of time. You get the podcasts. You get all the analysis. But the most important thing you get is the message boards, which will allow you to go ahead and get the inside scoop on things we can't necessarily put a story on, but we can write about rumors, innuendos, and what ifs in those pages. And not only can you read those, but you can interact with Brad, with Ked, with Matt, with Larry and myself and thousands of other Illini fans. It, may, it is a great community. It's a lot of fun. We'd like to have more people join it. Until next time, go Illini.